Right, okay. So we work on immunity to influenza. Um, I've been doing that for a long time uh, and also working with other viruses. Um, I'm turning 73 next month, so I'm not doing a lot of actual research. I work with bright young people who sort of allow me to talk about their research. Uh, the um, two labs, one in the University of Melbourne, uh, the Department of Microbiology. This is our new building, which we'll be occupying in, uh, from the end of the year, actually. That's an artist's impression, but the, the actual building looks pretty much like that now. That's part of uh, Rudd One's stimulus package. We got about 80 million bucks out of the Fed, but it's a $240 million building. Uh, what we're doing to, in that building is bringing together the academic microbiology department with the uh, state virus and bacterial diagnostic labs, World Health Organization Influenza Center, uh, the physicians from the infectious disease physicians from the hospital, tuberculosis unit, and so forth. And what we're trying to do is bring back together the academic, uh, strictly more academic areas, together with the practical business of human infectious disease. And of course, that's particularly apt at the moment because of the enormous advances in genomics, sequencing, and all the rest of it. And we can do a lot with organisms straight out of the environment and with, uh, also with humans if we're talking about immune responses and so forth. Um, and um, that's the group there. Uh, it's headed by, uh, by three of my former postdocs who are now, uh, one's a full professor and deputy head of the department, and um, the other two are associate professors and, uh, and running their own research program. So it's, you know, one of the great things about sort of being a senior scientist is to see the young people emerge. Uh, in 2002, I came back to Australia after spending a number of years at St Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. That may seem an unlikely place to spend your time. I mean, it's known mainly for Elvis, for Martin Luther King being <laughs> shot there, uh, the home of FedEx, but it's also the home of St Jude, which is, is an incredible kids' cancer hospital that made the really big breakthroughs in treating paediatric acute lymphoblastic leukaemia uh, almost 50 years ago now by going in with very aggressive chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and all the rest of it and uh, in using approaches that no one would thought would work because they weren't working in adults. People weren't willing to try those approaches in children because they thought we can't inflict this on children. But it turned out that childhood cancer in many cases is much easier to deal with than adult cancer and they had big successes early on. Uh, it was started by a Hollywood ident identity called Danny Thomas. I don't know if uh, some of the older people in the audience might remember Danny Thomas. He was an American Lebanese uh, Christian guy and, uh, and he made a vow uh, when he was trying to make it as an entertainer in Chicago, he made a vow in, in front of the statue of St Jude saying that if he made it as, as an entertainer he would do something in the name of St Jude and he put his last dollar in the box and the next day he got a job as a singing toothbrush in a commercial <laughs> and he never looked back from there and he went to Hollywood and he produced sitcoms and movies and, uh, and his, uh, he um, uh, he produced high quality uh, TV, uh, intellectual sort of stuff like Mr. Ed the Talking Horse and <laughs> Gilligan's Island. And uh, he, he, he went to talk to the bishop and said, you know, what should I do to fulfill my vow after he became very successful? And the guy said, start a hospital in Memphis. He went down there. They didn't want a kid's hospital because they already had one for black kids and one for white kids because this was before the reconciliation that happened under, under Johnson. And uh, so he started a research hospital. Um, the hospital treats all kids free, it deals with catastrophic diseases in kids. Uh, last year it raised $800 million in public subscription. That's not insurance, that's not research grants, it's not recovery of uh, anything, it's just uh, donations. And it, uh, his daughter Milo Thomas, who's also an actress, uh, raises a lot of money for it. She was Jennifer Aniston's mother in Cheers or Bills or something, I don't know. <laughs> She was Jennifer Addison's mother. I, I, I met Jennifer Addison. I, I didn't know who she was, but uh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. And, uh, um, and her, her, her brother, Tony Thomas, is, um, is the guy who produced uh, all those Robin Williams movies, you know, Dead Poets and all those movies. So, um, so uh, an American story. We, don't, we haven't got stories like that in this country. Uh, and we need to try and involve our celebrities a lot more in... Uh, 
in, in, in things like doing good things. And uh, unfortunately, some of them don't seem to be too bright, but anyway. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the residual group at St Jude. Paul was my postdoc. He's now an assistant professor. He's running the program. And uh, I'm uh, gradually going uh, on the beach. Um, influenza. The thing about influenza is that it's in, uh, very infectious. Uh, disease, and the thing that's problematic with it in particular from the clinical aspect is that people are infected and they feel reasonably okay, but the virus grows very fast and you're coughing and spluttering a lot of virus out before you feel really sick. So you'll still get on a plane and travel and, and you can see the kind of spray that comes out with a cough. Uh, actually, it it gets around quickly by air travel, basically. And uh, if you're travelling on a plane, it's not that if someone's coughing on the plane that you're necessarily going to get infected through the air handling system. It, the, the, the data shows that actually you're at risk of someone coughing if you're sitting within two or three seats or two or three rows of them. But the whole plane's not at risk. You're at more risk if you're in an aisle seat. In general, with infectious disease, all infectious disease, the, the most single most important protective mechanism, apart from being vaccinated, is to wash hands regularly and to, and to, uh, and to use good hand hygiene. Um, you know, don't pick your nose, sort of thing. Uh, uh, and and uh, that is really central. You know, when they have those bacterial resistant out, uh, MRSAs, the multi-drug resistant outbreaks with bacteria in hospitals, they immediately institute very rigorous hand washing procedures. They're there all the time, but where there's no problem, people forget about them. So you'll have these wall mounted sterilizers and all the rest of it. People stop using them, and these are trained medical professionals. They stop using them. And, and once there's an outbreak, of course, they all become very conscious of it. They, they start using them again, the incidence falls, and the whole thing cures, and then again people forget about it. So um, we, we don't realise just how many times we touch our hands to our faces. It, it's, it's an enormous number of times, and, and that is one of the major transmission. Uh, the other transmission is, uh, I mean, respiratory is obviously the biggest risk. Uh, being bitten by a mosquito is a risk if you're in a in a mosquito uh, infected area, but the other thing is uh, uh, gastrointestinal and the classically highly infectious viruses through gastrointestinal that some of us may have encountered is the noroviruses which cause these outbreak on cruise ships where everyone is throwing up on the whole ship. Everyone's throwing up. It's not fun, that sort of holiday. We actually need a vaccine. They change quite a bit. You probably don't realise it, but we get regular pandemics of norovirus all the time. Uh, these viruses change. They're a bit like influenza. They change, and you get a new pandemic coming through. Um, Lee Sales wasn't on the 7.30 report earlier in the year because she was throwing up and so forth. And then we got to the US, and everyone's throwing up in Boston and so forth. So um, uh, at this moment, no vaccines, no drugs. Uh, this is an electron micrographic picture of flu virus. Um, it's an RNA virus. It's got eight genes, about 11 proteins. It's, uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, and that's a schematic of it. It's uh, uh, got uh, two surface glycoproteins that are important, the hemagglutinin. The hemagglutinin is the protein that binds to sialic acids on the cell surface and and gets the virus into the cell. And then it has an enzyme, a neuraminidase, which when the virus particles have been made within the cells, because viruses can only grow within living cells, they have no independent life, unlike bacteria. They can only grow within living cells. The neuraminidase then gets the, the newly made virus away from the cell. And that's, uh, those are the two functions. Viruses have to get some way of getting in, and, then, and they have to have some sort of mechanism for getting away from the cell. And, uh, and that's what the neuraminidase does. Now, the, the drugs, Relenza, uh, Tamiflu, and so forth, which were uh, the first drug was discovered in Australia. Peter Coleman in Melbourne, structural biologist, they did the structure of the influenza neuraminidase. They worked out where the neuraminidase binding site was, and then Mark von Itstein des designed a small molecule to fit into that. And that's Relenza, and then Tamiflu is the development of that. These viruses, act, these drugs actually stop 
the virus from releasing and stop the infectious process from continuing. As cells get infected, they produce virus particles. The virus particles come out, they infect more cells, and so on and so on. So they actually hold the virus on the cell. If you look at an electron micrograph, you can actually see the virus being held on the surface of the cell uh, by in, in, a, in a Tamiflu treated individual. Drugs work okay, but they have to be given very early, so you have to take them right at the beginning of the infection uh, to have a good, good effect. And some of the viruses mutate away from them very quickly. Um, so it's got, uh, this, this is the genetic material, the hemagglutinin, which is H, neuraminidase, that's N. Now, there's an enormous variety of influenza viruses in nature. They are maintained in nature in aquatic birds. The reason they're maintained in aquatic birds is the bird... Uh, they're basically bird infections. The bird gets an infection, not usually a respiratory infection. It's a gastrointestinal tract infection, relatively mild. Um, the, virus, the bird then will excrete virus for about eight to ten days through the gastrointestinal tract into water. And the virus survives extremely well in water. Now, that's an ideal ecological system for maintaining a virus in nature because if you have a large body of fresh water, you get all sorts of water birds coming onto it. And even if the virus mutates so that it can become lethal for some species of birds, it won't be lethal for other species of birds. So well, that's what happened with the bird flu virus, the H5N1, when it mutated to become what we call a high pathogenicity virus. It started to kill wild birds. It killed swans. It killed geese. It killed flamingos. But it didn't kill ducks. And so even though the, the, those species were being killed and could not transmit it because they were very sick and dying, the ducks did transmit it, and the ducks carried the virus from China. Quing High Lake was where this actually, actually happened in 2005. The ducks carried it west to Europe, to North Africa, and so forth, and we got this bird flu thing spreading. Bird flu, the H5N1, has so far infected, I think, somewhere around about 600 people since 1997. It's gone into people when they've got a very, very high dose of virus. Uh, classical case is the, the birds get sick. Uh, the little farmer in Cambodia or something knows that, uh, that his birds are going to be killed by the authorities. He, he calls his son and says, well, look, before they kill them, let's get a meal out of these. Uh, take this one across to auntie. Kid stucks, stuffs the birds down his shirt front, pedals off on his bike. Bird's breathing here. He's breathing here. Virus gets deep into the lungs. He dies. And... Uh, Sad story, true story. And uh, basically, uh, they're not very infectious for humans. They have to get deep into the lung because we have bird-like receptors. There are two types of receptors, a mammalian type and a bird type. We have bird-like receptors deep in the lung. Uh, killed about 60% of people who have been infected with it. Um, you all have heard about H7N9, which has just come out in China. Uh, very much the Chinese authorities have been doing a fantastic job with it. Uh, they're very, very different from what happened initially in the SARS thing. Uh, it's a virus that's come out around Shanghai. About 120 people, 140 people infected so far, about a 30% death rate. Uh, like a lot of influenza viruses, this one is going, it's going from birds to humans, though unlike the H5N1, it's not causing a severe disease in birds. The H5N1 virus has, uh, as a consequence of, of the deaths that it's caused in birds, and as a consequence of the elimination measures, trying to, trying to kill out these birds that are infected to control it, uh, uh, somewhere between 500 million and a billion domestic poultry have been killed. We don't know how many, uh, but you know that's an enormous economic loss for poor farmers in Asia. It may, makes a tremendous difference to you know whether they can get their kids to school and all the rest of it. So these are catastrophic pandemics, if you like, even without causing a major human pandemic. Uh, we often overlook that, that the fact that the, the effect on, on domestic animals can be really quite horrendous. Um, the H7N9, uh, like many flu viruses, generally influenza viruses, are most dangerous for the elderly. And uh, most of the people who have died in, from this virus uh, are elderly people. They're men, actually, older men, probably smokers, because that, that compromises their lung function. And uh, they, there's a very strong correlation with the type 1 interferon genetic defect. So it's probably what's killing them are, are events that happen very early in the infection when these non-specific uh, uh, interferon type mechanisms turn on. 
and, and don't control the infection early, you probably get a lot more spread, a lot more infection, and that means that they don't come out of hospital. Um, the Chinese have been handling this. They've had people on ECMO, uh, you know, the, the heart-lung type uh, thing, breathing for them. Uh, got some people through it, some not, and so forth. Um, so H7N9, we're sort of watching it closely. The main danger with it is it looks very much genetically like the viruses that will spread between humans. And we're worried that it could change relatively quickly to start to spread between humans. We've had so far one clear case, I think, of human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, no real cases of human-to-human -human transmission with H5N1. H7N7, uh, it's, a, it's a duck virus. The, um, uh, the virus um, uh, caused a big outbreak in the Netherlands some years back. The, the Dutch got very concerned about chicken houses, so they put all their chickens out in free range where they got infected by the ducks, and so then they had to kill millions of chickens. So, uh, uh, and a, and a, uh, a lot of people got infected, but not only one person died, I think. Um, the viruses that have come across into us and classically circulating in us, uh, H1N1, that's the 1918 pandemic flu that killed about uh, 50 million people. We reconstructed that virus from, by PCR from museum specimens and from people who had been frozen and buried very quickly up in the tundra. Um, and of course it came back in uh, 1976. When the virus came back in 1976, those who survived the 1918 pandemic and were really quite old were completely protected because the virus was still very similar to that virus that had circulated in 1918. And then uh, H1N1 viruses have been circulating since then in human populations. They've been changing all the time because they change very rapidly by mutation. But when the H1N1 virus came back in 2009 and it came out of pigs in, in, in Mexico, when it came back in 2009, those of us who were born before 1950 were relatively protected because we had cross-reactive immunity to an earlier virus, whereas the younger people were more affected. That's one reason why the H1N1 2009 wasn't as severe as, as it might have been, because older people, who are usually the targets, uh, were, were OK. Uh, it did cause a lot of problems, though. It caused a lot of problems for pregnant, heavily pregnant women. It caused, a lot of, it caused some very acute deaths in, in fit young adults. And it caused a lot of problems in our indigenous community and in indigenous communities everywhere, where there's, there are certain other health problems. And also big problems in India. And so it, it was a bad virus, but not for our sort of demographic in the whole. Um, influenza viruses grow in all species, uh, pigs, uh, horses, uh, dogs. We don't have flu in dogs in Australia. We had a horse flu outbreak, uh, uh, you may remember, a few years back. Race horses came in, virus got out of the quarantine, uh, caused a problem there. I think we spent some millions of dollars uh, compensating people and so forth. Um, seals, whales, uh, any warm-blooded vertebrate almost will catch flu. Uh, the surrogate species for humans is actually the ferret. And of course, we all have a lot of ferret-like friends. So, um, <laughs> at the moment, the virus is sort of the flu season is just starting. Uh, it's a good idea to get the vaccine. It's not the world's greatest vaccine, but I, I get it regularly. Uh, I also had the flu not so long back, even despite being vaccinated both in the southern and the northern hemisphere. But it's a good idea to get it because older people are, really are vulnerable. The virus that's circulating at the moment is the H1N1, the 2009. There's an H3N2, uh, which is a bit changed from what was around last year, and there's an influenza B virus. They don't go into, um, into birds. So. Viruses are coming out of nature all the time. Um, HIV AIDS came out of chimps. Uh, the SARS virus came out of bats. Uh, bats infected civet cats uh, in southern China. They eat civet cats and cook them. It went from those civet cats into humans. And they had the SARS outbreak. About 800 people uh, uh, died, I think, uh, and uh, in total, not an enormous uh, mortality. Every year, somewhere between 20 and 40,000 Americans die of influenza, but mainly older people. Um, and we have a similar proportionality here, but we're used to it, we're accustomed to it. Um, the, uh, the bats have turned out to be a big source of infection. SARS turned out to be a bat coronavirus. We've got a bat coronavirus in the Middle East at the moment, possibly going from bats to camels to humans. The Hendra virus is a, is a bat virus. It's a paramyxo. It goes from bats to horses to humans. The Nipah virus goes from bats to pigs to humans and so forth. So there seems to be this need for a multiplier. 
prior to uh, about uh, the year 2000, we only knew one type of virus that was prevalent in bats, and that was rabies virus in biting bats in South America, and the related, closely related lysoviruses. We've had two deaths in uh, Australia from lysovirus in bats, uh, some in Scotland as well. Uh, this virus is so close to rabies, it's in Australian bats, it's so close to rabies that you can protect licensed bat handlers. We have 300 licensed bat handlers in Australia. <laughs> you can protect licensed bat handlers by vaccinating them against rabies. And so it's, um, it's very, very close indeed, but it hasn't ever established in dogs. And this is a bit of the theme with these infections. They're sitting around there and then for some reason something happens and they come out into human populations. And that is of course what happened with HIV AIDS. Changing societal attitudes, uh, possibly under the Belgians in the 1930s, a high instance of, of sort of semi uh, semi-domestic uh, prostitution and, and that actually got the uh, virus into the, uh, into the human population we think and then of course it was spread by rapid air travel, uh, societal changes in various ways and all the rest of it and so, uh, so this is one of we're constantly being challenged by these things and our pandemic viruses uh, come out of, uh, out of nature almost by definition. Uh, one that we're watching very, one that's been interesting closely as closely as chikungunya virus. This is an insect borne virus, very related to our, close to our Ross River virus, causes an epidemic polyarthritis with rash. Chikungunya in the African language uh, where it was first described means he who bends over and the people are just so so much in pain that they're bent over like this. Uh, it suddenly started to come out of Africa, uh, up into Italy, right across to Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, we've had cases in Western Australia, but only in people who've come back from Bali on vacation. It could easily get going in our Australian population because we have all the mosquitoes and all the rest of it that will transmit it. And of course, with climate change, as, as, uh, as, as, as things warm, as species move away from the equator, which is what we can see already with birds, and butterflies and so forth, then, then we'll see these insect-borne viruses moving further south. On the whole, though, we handle them by insect control. Very important if you're in those areas to, to take uh, uh, some insect repellent and use it because uh, there's some nasty viruses around. Uh, dengue virus, which was only in about, after the Second World War, was only in about 20 countries, I think, is now all over the place. And uh, we think it got around by air travel, by tyres being moved around the world for reprocessing. Used tyres that have water in them where mosquitoes, larvae breed, then you put them on a ship and send them somewhere to be reprocessed and you carry the disease with it. Yellow fever virus, another insect-borne one, came across to the Americas in the slave ships in the, uh, in the, uh, in the slave area and so on. Um, if you want to see a, uh, this has been described, uh, has anyone seen this movie, Contagion? Very few people saw it actually, it's described as a thinking man's horror movie, thinking person's <laughs> horror movie, sorry. Uh, it's, it, it is a horror movie. This is a, this is a, a classic uh, bat-borne virus which goes into a pig, uh, the pig goes to a restaurant, uh, the chef uh, dresses the pig and shakes hands with Gwyneth Paltrow, who then takes it to uh, first Chicago where she has a brief liaison, then back to Minnesota where she lives. And this is a pandemic that's like nothing else. It's like nothing that we've seen since the, the Black Death. It, during the Black Death, when the plague bacillus was circulating in Europe, from, 20, uh, th from 30 to 50 percent of the population of various cities died. Can you imagine that? Half the people dying? And, uh, and it went on for hundreds of years because we didn't understand infectious disease. And um, uh, we were in, in Greece not so long back and we sort of walked up into the hills and there was a village that had been abandoned in the 19th century because of plague uh, taking everyone out. And of course we didn't understand anything about infectious disease until Pasteur and Koch in the 19th century. So our understanding of what an infectious disease is is only about 160 years old. 
I mean, human beings have been around for 120,000, 200,000 years, hominids for much longer than that, but our understanding of infection is very, very recent indeed, as it is of so many areas of science. And, um, and this movie is uh, it's, it's actually scientifically good, but evidently the pe reason people didn't want to see it is because it's, it's scientifically valid, there's not enough drama in it, there's a lot of people dying uh, and, pe and the reason they didn't want to see it is people are doing sensible things, you know when people do sensible things there's no drama you, would, you, you can't have a sitcom without people constantly doing very stupid things, right and, and that's, that's Hollywood and of course Hollywood movies are made for a 12-year-old of average intelligence. This, this would actually appeal to a 14-year-old. I mean, so, you know. Anyway, do go and see it. It's actually a pretty good movie, except there's one, there's one mistake in it, but I won't tell you what it is. Yeah. So, because we're constantly being challenged by these things, you've got no way of predicting what they are or where they're coming from or what their nature is. Uh, and, and we, of course, are, are long-lived, very complex, multi-organ, multicellular systems. We evolve very slowly because of, uh, of our long generation times, whereas viruses and bacteria evolve with enormous speed. Uh, some change, some don't, but we, and then there's the problem of constantly being assaulted by new ones. So we have to have a very sophisticated and very comprehensive immune system to deal with these things, otherwise we're not survivable. Now, uh, the, immune, the word immune actually comes from the Latin. It comes from the term immunus without tax. And it refers to the fact that um, Roman legionnaires for a time, when they came back from the wars, were tax exempt. Uh, like rich Republicans in the US. And, uh, and so they were called the Genio Immunium. They prayed to the goddess Minerva, and uh, that's got nothing to do with it, but still. And um, so the tax that the immune system t seeks to defeat is the tax of infection, the tax of organisms that want to live in or on us. And it does that pretty effectively, and we live fairly long lives. Now, basically, all immune uh, re system responses are based on, ce on cells. They're cellular responses. Uh, some of the earlier nate response, the very earliest response after an infection gets in, is at the level of the cell that's infected. When a cell's infected, it will produce molecules like type 1 interferons and so forth to try and slow that whole process down. And that's part of the innate response. And then we have various more or less specialised type cells of the innate response uh, that, that will deal with infection at some level. But it can never completely handle the infection. Um, the white blood cells, and it's all a property of the white blood cells, because at some stage or other, the cells that make up the immune system, they come from the bone marrow. Some of them have to differentiate through the thymus, the T lymphocytes. Others come directly from the bone marrow. They're circulating in the blood. These are the white blood cells. Now, interestingly, the white blood cells weren't even discovered until the early part of the 19th century. Leeuwenhoek, the, uh, the Dutch guy who made those microscopes that you may have seen, very primitive, uh, actually saw red blood cells because he was looking at, um, at membrane preparation, say from a chick embryo membranes. I'm not even going to get to my talk at this rate. Right I'm very sorry. <laughs> How many hours have I got? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I won't be more. That, you know, that's the trouble with old Nobel Prize winners. They, never make <laughs> they get Alzheimer's disease at the same rate as everybody else, I can tell you. Uh, Greek time is relativistic. Greek time? We're on Greek time? No, Greek time is relativistic. Okay, okay, okay. So anyway, the white blood cells. Uh, so Leeuwenhoek didn't see the white blood cells. He saw the red cells rushing past, but the red, white cells are really much, much rarer, and so he didn't see them. There is actually one white blood cell known to be associated with Leeuwenhoek. It's on one of his slides that he left, and it's probably his from his snot. Actually, <laughs> so if we actually did PCR on that cell, if it's in good enough shape, we might be able to clone Leeuwenhoek. <laughs> So they're first discovered in the early 19th century. Then we didn't know much about them for a while until the German dye industry came along. And that grew out of the, I mean, you may have read that book, Purple, where it drives, goes out of indigo and all that sort of stuff in the UK. And the Germans got onto this very fast. And they were using dyes to stain cells. 
And so the great pathologist, Rudolf Virchow, for instance, who's the first guy who really starts to look very seriously at tissues and stain them so you can differentiate various structures in them, recognised the white blood cells and he recognised them coming into, into uh, sites of damage, inflammation and so forth. And so he, he reckoned there's something about to do with the process of repair or the process of control of infection. Uh, Paul Ehrlich, uh, the great immunologist uh, from way back, who's the first guy to really talk about receptors and specificity and so forth uh, in the immune response. He actually got it wrong, but his thoughts and, and, and his ideas were very incisive in this. Uh, and so they then start to differentiate these different types of white blood cells. And we start to see that there are different types. We, we realise that there's a monocytes and macrophages. They were worked out very quickly. These are uh, white blood cells that actually engulf things and destroy things. And that was worked out by Metchnikoff in, uh, in the uh, uh, in later part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. Mech the story is Metchnikoff, who was a Russian working at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, uh, was at the beach and he was supposed to be looking after the kids. He was a typical scientist, dad, Aspergerish and, and hopeless. And, uh, and, and uh, he started to play around with starfish larvae and, and poke thorns into them. And he saw these cells accumulating around the thorns and trying to eat the thorns and so forth. And, and he got the Nobel Prize with Paul Ehrlich for discovering the macrophage, the cells. These are the clean-up cells in the immune system that, that engulf a lot of stuff. They do a lot of other things too, but they're really important. Um, the one cell that wasn't understood very well for a very long time, we saw other types of cells like basophils and eosinophils, and we found that they produced various molecules, uh, histamines and all this sort of thing, and we developed some sort of idea of what they do. But the one cell that was really mysterious for a very long time was a cell called the lymphocyte, the small white blood cell, the most common cell in the peripheral blood. It's a small cell, has very little cytoplasm and a very big nucleus. And until the 1950s, people did not know what these cells did, which is really quite extraordinary. They had no idea. Uh, the, the, the prevailing idea was uh, from, this, from actually draining these out. So these are the cells that circulate through the lymph system as well as through the blood system. They go through tissues and through the lymph, as we now understand. But if you drain cells from the lymph of, say, a rabbit, uh, you could find these cells in large numbers. And the idea was that these lymphocytes were the progenitors for the red blood cells and the macrophages and that they would, they would cause the production of that element, most of which in us is produced in the bone marrow. That turned out to be completely wrong. And the guy who worked it out was a guy called Jim Gowans. I just interviewed him recently because I'm going to write a book about this sometime if I survive long enough. And, and Jim... What Jim, Jim graduated from medical school in about 1948 or 49 and he uh, went into the, the hospital and he hated it. He just hated the authoritarian, hierarchical, you know, traditional British uh, God, God professor type system of that time. You know, things have all changed in medicine. It's not like that, especially in Australian medicine, but uh, and American uh, even more so. But but that's how it was. He hated it, and so he uh, was a bit of a francophile. He wrote to the to the secretary of the medical research council. So this is a young medical graduate. He writes to the top medical doctor in the land who's handing out the money for research and stuff. And, and the guy writes back, and he's, he's you know saying, what what should I do? I'd like to do research. And the guy says, well, I'll do what you want. And, and he, he arranged for him to go to the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And, and he got interested, though he was there at the time of Lavoif and Manot, uh, who were the great, really some of the founders of molecular biology and won the Nobel Prize for it. He got very interested in immunology, came back to, to Britain, and he, uh, and again, Mellonby, the, the secretary of the MRC, suggested he go and see Howard Florey. Now, Howard Florey used to be on our $50 banknote. He, uh, he's the guy who, with Ernst Chain, uh, the chemist, uh, emigre chemist, developed Fleming's discovery of penicillin for use in humans. And it was, penicillin was available by D-Day. It saved enormous numbers of lives on both sides. And, and it was the great wonder drug, of course, after the sulfonamides of the 1930s. And uh, so Flory, uh, he got to meet Flory. And Mellonby, when he talked to Mellonby initially, Mellonby said, well, you can do research if you want, but you won't be any good at it, and you'll never make any money. And uh, so then he goes to see Flory. The first thing Flory says, well, yeah, if you want to do research, fine. You'll never make any money and you'll no never be any good at it, but still, why not? And so Flory gives him the job of finding out what the lymphocyte is. You know, what does it do? 
uh, Flory's professor at Oxford. So, so what um, Gowan starts to do these lymph duct draining experiments where you can drain the lymphocytes out. But he's clever. He uses nuclear medicine, right? He does autoradiographs. This is a new technique. What you do is you take the lymphocyte, you label the lymphocyte, and then you infuse it back in. And then by doing autoradiographs and developing from sections, you can see where the lymphocyte goes. And what, what Gowans realizes is the lymphocytes recirculating through the tissues, from the blood, through the tissues, back into the lymph nodes, these glands and so forth. And he starts to, he develops the idea of the lymphocyte as the recirculating cell of the immune system. And he starts to take, carry that forward in a number of very incisive experiments. And then Jacques Miller, an expatriate, uh, uh, a French Swiss, who was, uh, grew up in Australia, and the, the family fled here during the Second World War, and, uh, and went to school in Sydney and then medical school and uh, uh, wanted to research at the Chester Beatty Institute, started to remove the thymus from baby mice because he was studying leukaemia and it was a thymic leukaemia. And he thought if he removed the thymus, he could study leukaemia. What he found is he completely screwed up the immune system. And he discovered what we call the T lymphocytes. Then we start to discover the lineage of the B lymphocytes, the antibody producing cells. So we didn't really work any of this out until the 1950s and early 1960s, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, didn't know what the thymus was for forever. Everyone thought it was some sort of vestigial organism and organ and all the rest of it. Should have been a Nobel Prize for this. Never was. We, the two guys are still alive, so we can still try, but probably won't manage to, to do that. Um, so the immune system itself, as I mentioned briefly, it divides into two main components. The innate system, which is very old. It's all these secreted molecules, uh, cells that we call natural killer cells and so forth. We can trace elements of that, that back into, say, fruit fly. In fact, the, the, uh, the toll-like receptors of the NK cells were actually discovered in fruit fly. So phylogenetically, it goes right through biology. Um, and then we have what's called the adaptive immune system, which is the immune system of the B cells and the T cells, the one that we prime up with vaccination, the one that responds specifically and very specifically to infection, wipes out the infected cells, wipes out the bugs and so forth. That phylogenetically goes back to the jawed fish. It's about 300 million uh, plus years old, 350 million plus years old. A uh, bit, of, bit of it before that in lampreys has, has recently been discovered, but it really is right through the vertebrates and only the vertebrates. And so it's in the reptiles, the birds, the mammals. It's, it's, in all those species, it does much the same thing. Though because of the long evolutionary leads in these, it, it actually is organised a bit differently in each of them. And that's quite an interesting exercise in comparative biology. Uh, but it's the adaptive immune system that we're interested in when we're talking about vaccination. And what we're particularly interested in with the adaptive immune system is immunological memory, because that's the basis of vaccination, that when you're either infected with an attenuated, that is a less dangerous form of the organism, like the Sabin polio vaccine, or you're, you're exposed to a bit of the virus, like the hepatitis B vaccine, which is a recombinant protein made from hepatitis B. You make an antibody response, you may make a T-cell response, and it's this memory that persists. And it's that memory now, we realise, can persist for up to 50 years. And we realise that from influenza, uh, we realise it from things that people who are given yellow fever vaccine way back uh, when they were young, still have uh, antibodies and, uh, and are capable of responding to it. Um, smallpox, um, long-term memory, and again, and it's long-term memory that, that protects us. It may be useful to boost it up, uh, but it does survive a very, very long time. Uh, the picture is that uh, the first person to describe it was actually Thucydides in his book on the Peloponnesian Wars. He described the plague of Athens and told how uh, people who'd had the plague, which well, probably wasn't plague, it was probably typhus, people who'd had the plague could nurse the sick because they could not catch the disease a second time. So that's the basis of immune protection. And, and then the other thing he noticed is it was specific. That is, if they were protected against the plague, they were protected against the coughs and flus and so forth. So that's the basis of immunity and in, in immunological memory. But we really don't start to take this apart, really, until well into the 20th century. So uh, it's been around a long time, and the consciousness of the effect has been around a long time. Um, and actually, we still can't convince a lot of people in the community, or some people in the community, to vaccinate their kids. So they understand less than the um, So, And it's pretty hard to get it across, you know. 
you know how poisonous uh, uh, poisonous fluoride is in the water and all that. I mean, you know, it's it's very di this whole business of science communication and talking to the broader community has become much more difficult. I think since uh, since the internet really got underway. Even though there's great information on the internet, this is great disinformation. So we have good vaccines against a number of things. We have reasonably good vaccines against influenza, but you have to keep changing them because the viruses change all the time. We have totally failed with the vaccine against HIV. We've spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of very good people have worked on it. Nobody knows really how to handle it. We're hoping we may be able to... to the, 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 the hope at the moment with HIV, the problem is the virus mutates all the time. Gets into us, it persists. Flu gets into us and it mutates, but it doesn't persist. And so it gets wiped out. But, but the HIV gets reintegrated back into the genome, it persists and you can't get rid of it unless we develop some molecular technology like RNA interference to get rid of it. And that may be the real hope with curing people with HIV uh, is to do something of that sort. But with the vaccines, it simply escapes and there's too many variants of it and we haven't been able to make it. And so we're kind of defeated on it at the moment. The, the hope is with the structural biologists at the moment, the people who are looking at the surface glycoproteins that are bound by the antibody molecules. That's a, a schematic of a... I don't know what I did with my pointer. I've lost it somewhere. Here we go. Yeah, that's a schematic of an antibody molecule there. Oh, that's actually the schematic of the neuraminidase structure that led to the Rolenza uh, drug that Peter Coleman in Melbourne did that. That's CSRO. And so, um, so HIV always escapes. The hope with the structural biologists is they may be able to, to identify in the glycoprotein an area which is conserved uh, in the virus and we may be able to target the antibodies to it. But, and we're trying to do that with influenza as well. Uh, but so far it hasn't worked all that well. I mean, there's some results, and, uh, uh, but not, uh, not as promising as we'd like. And we haven't worked out how to make a vaccine of that type. Um, other, other viruses we've got, super vaccines, yellow fever vaccine is fantastic. It, uh, it's one of the best vaccines we've got. Um, polio vaccine, measles vaccine and all the rest of it. We've got very get good vaccines against systemic infections by viruses that don't change very much. I mean, measles gets in the oropharynx, uh, not a problem. But then it gets into the blood. If it gets into the blood and there's antibody there due to the vaccine, it'll be taken out. If not, it'll go around the body. It'll go into the brain, the ear, the skin. You'll get skin spots. You can get virus hanging around in the brain. You can get long-term lung damage. You can get all sorts of things. People think measles is a mild disease. It's actually a very bad disease and so forth. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, still in the, uh, in the area of vaccines and prevention. And what's coming along, of course, with HIV we haven't failed because we've done fantastically well on the pharmacology side of it. But the problem is the drugs have to be taken regularly, even at the cheapest form where they're made in India, provided with a lot of assistance, they, they still uh, are a real problem uh, paying for those in poorer countries. And, uh, and um, the other parishes may be more molecular, like interference and all, all the rest of it. Now, what I'm going to talk about now is the uh, part of the immune system I work on, which is the killer T cell. So if you think of that image of the gladiator, it's, it's not like the antibody molecule, which is secreted by cells and circulates in the blood. These are the cells that have to get up close and personal with, say, a virus-infected cell, and they contact the cell and they kill it. They, 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 they are actually the hit men of the immune system. So they're, they're a bit like the Roman soldier whose principal weapon was actually a short stabbing sword. And so, you know, the Roman soldiers would all get together with this phalanx of shields and the, the wild Scotsmen with their big swords would come and chop away at them and they'd poke them in the tummy with the stick and that would be the end of them. Uh, and they also had a backup. Uh, they had a dagger as well. And that's a bit like these immune T cells. They have various different mechanisms that all work at very short range, only as a result of contact and specific recognition. Uh, the dog in armour is uh, nothing to do with anything. It's, a, it's an immunological joke, and like most scientific jokes, it's really bad. <laughs> Like Canine from the Doctor Who series. Ah, okay, a new insight, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, now, I've got to work how to turn this on. Uh, where's my cursor? Oh, I can do it here, can I? There we are. Now, what we're going to see is this cell here, with the, it's got a green nucleus, and another little cell, which is green, because it's a small lymphocyte and a killer cell, is going to kill it. And as it's, as it's destroying the cell membrane integrity, you'll see the cell turn pink. 
And it turns pink because there's pink dye in the medium. And that pink dye has then been concentrated in the cell. So you're going to see this cell destroy the membrane integrity of that cell and then totally zap it. So that's the killer T cell up the top. And it's groping all over the cell. It's actually binding very specifically. It's breached the membrane and it's killed it. And that's about as killed as you can get, isn't it, really? And, uh, <laughs> and that means if that cell was full of virus, the virus would, would go with it. It would be killed along with it. And now one of those macrophages would come along and gobble that up and get rid of it. So it's quite hard to find those dead cells in culture. This is done in a tissue culture dish. Uh, it's actually the, uh, you see that that, that T cell hasn't detached yet. Now, now one of them's gone. And so um, this, this was made by Misty Jenkins, a former PhD student uh, who was in Cambridge, now come back and working at Peter Mac Cancer Institute. Uh, a Curie scholar. Uh, she she uh, gets a lot more tan when she gets out in the sun. That was in her <laughs> English phase. Um, uh, so that's what these cells do. These are the cells that go into tissues, find damaged cells. They keep some forms of cancer under control. Uh, skin cancer, for instance, is kept under control by these cells, usually for a long time. Uh, melanoma can be kept under control, and then the melanoma mutates and escapes. Uh, we're now finding, particularly from the work of Jim Allison, that there are various molecules that, when these cells get into a cancer, the cancer may be able to turn them off because the cancer is a big organism itself and it's producing all sorts of stuff. And it may be able to turn those cells off. We're now finding some monoclonal antibodies that can turn those T cells back on. And in some forms of cancer, we're wiping them out with these killer T cells. And we've also known that we can do that with um, virus-induced cancers, particularly in kids. And uh, there were experiments that were done quite some time back. And so these killer T cells are part of the white hope in, in cancer at the moment. Now, this is a virus-infected cell, uh, all the virus particles in it. And this is the cell, this is the T cell, this is the nucleus of the killed cell that's been killed. What actually the cell does is it has various serine esterases, it has a pore-forming protein perforin. These things come across into the cytoplasm of this cell. What they actually do is turn on the cell death pathway. All cells are programmed to commit suicide if they go wrong. You know, one of the reasons we get cancer is because the molecules that are tell should tell them to commit suicide don't because they've mutated and they're no longer uh, being uh, functioning properly. And so what these killer T cells do is turn on the cell death pathway and we destroy the virus infected cell. And uh, that's uh, uh, basically the, the mechanism. Now, of course, if you've got a mechanism like that, it has to be very precisely targeted <laughs> because you can't have cells going around the body just killing indiscriminately. You don't want uh, 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 promiscuous killing. And so the way that works, and this is why we got the Nobel Prize, we discovered the basic uh, mechanism, which is that the killer T cell receptor and, and when we discovered it, we didn't know what the T-cell receptor was. It was always called the enigmatic T-cell receptor, actually. The killer T-cell receptor recognises some of our own self-molecules, specifically the transplantation molecules, class 1 MHC glycoproteins, they're called. But these are the molecules that are recognised in graft rejection. And they're very diverse, very polymorphic. And it recognises one of those molecules with a bit of virus bound in the tip. And you can see it here. Excuse me. The, what you see there is a schematic of the T cell receptor. So that's the specific recognition. These are extremely diverse, and they're just as diverse as antibody molecules. Here's the transplantation molecule, the MHC glycoprotein, and it's got an 8 to 12 amino acid peptide from the virus in its tip. So what happens is when this, this structure is being formed in the cytoplasm of the cell, in the Golgi in fact, it associates with degraded protein, peptides from degraded protein in cell cytoplasm of cells that are replicating viruses. So this is foreign. This is self to the immune system. It's seen during development and it's ignored. Once this is there though, then this sees this is foreign, it turns on and it kills the cell. This picture was published the year that we got the Nobel Prize, Structural Biology from Ian Wilson, first co-crystallisation of T cell receptor and transplantation molecule with the peptide in the groove. Uh, so 1996 we got the prize, 1996 this was published. And we're still trying to, going ahead with a lot of experiments to work out uh, what exactly these recognition events are and how the binding work. But it's gone from really to this where we're looking at the chemistry and where the waters are and the stoichiometric interactions and the actual physical chemistry of these two events. It's gone from that to from 
our uh, experiments, which are these. This is what we drew. The, we didn't know what the T-cell receptor was. This is the modified transplantation molecule. We called it Alton Self. And of course, that justified the, uh, the contempt of all chemists when we showed those sort of pictures. Uh, <laughs> but you've got to, to be fair, I mean, we didn't have recombinant DNA technology. Very difficult to work with small amounts of protein that were bound to cell surface. And so it was about, we discovered this in 1973, 74. 1978, 79, before we first got the first sequences of transplantation molecules, about 23 amino acids, and we thought we were over the moon. Uh, and then, uh, of course, recombinant DNA technology came along, PCR came along, uh, and, uh, and of course, monoclonal antibodies and all that stuff. So if you're a young scientist, you've got to remember back to the days of the dinosaurs. I'm actually part of the living fossil record of biology. <laughs> uh, these are our crude experiments, but they are very crude experiments, but we we're very lucky uh, in that there was great technology around uh, of a different type, and it was a very traditional technology. And that technology was a technology that had been developed from, with mice to study transplantation. Once they recognised the transplantation reaction, saw what a powerful reaction it was, then people started to work it out. And the guy who worked it out was this guy, George Snell in the 1930s, working at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. Mega mouse, it's actually, we call it, because that's where a lot of the mouse strains are kept and come from. Uh, we buy a lot of mice from there. And George was trying to study cancer as a young guy. And he, uh, what he was doing is he was putting methyl on the surface of, on the skin of the mice. That causes a cancer. Then he was transplanting the cancers. And he found they were being very rapidly rejected. And he reasoned that it couldn't possibly be the immune response against the cancer. It was just too fast. It had to be the difference between the mice. So then they started to do a lot of experiments with inbred mice. They got the inbred mice from this lady, Miss Abby Lathrop, uh, who, was a, who was a chicken uh, a school teacher who had to give up because kids got her down. And, uh, and then she became a chicken farmer and failed. And then she became an ornamental mouse breeder. And in the early part of the century, and I believe they still do it in Japan, they bred ornamental mice for agouti, coat colour, all that sort of stuff. And if you, you're in an antique shop in the US, you sometimes see tiny cages. They're not bird cages, they're mouse cages. So she was line breeding these mice, and she provided the original mouse strains for the Jackson lab and for, um, and for Snell. And Snell went ahead then to the classic genetics, the type of genetics that was around long before Watson and Crick and DNA and all that sort of stuff. It was basically selective breeding, back crossing to isolate particular phenotypic characteristics. And he, he isolated in various genetically defined mouse strains these class 1 MHC molecules. And that meant when Rolf Zinkenagel and I found this effect where the transplantation molecules seemed to be focusing the immune response, we could get all these genetically modified, genetically defined mice and we were able to map it within a matter of months. Not only that, we had mutant mice with single point mutations in the transplantation molecule that would change the recognition event. And that we were able to reason from that and reason actually basically how the system works, though we didn't know the molecular details of how it worked. And so what we did is a very a couple of guys working with a not particularly competent technician, we, uh, we made a really big discovery. Totally unknown people uh, came out of nowhere. People were horrified, especially the geneticists. You know, here we were telling them, the transplant geneticists, what they'd been working with all those years. And these were very famous guys, and they didn't necessarily appreciate it. And, uh, and, but we, it, everything we did depended really on, uh, or working it out depended very much on Snell and his colleagues. And I make that point because all science builds on other science. Some people get lucky, they make a big finding as we did. Others don't get quite so lucky, but they make enormous contributions. And, uh, and Snell did get the Nobel Prize actually in 1980. But uh, uh, we, uh, we depended almost totally on, on him. So I'm not going to actually get to any science on this talk, it's just, uh, just general. Um, so that's the deal. If you want to win the Nobel Prize, you can read my book, The Beginner's Guide to Winning a Nobel Prize, uh, which tells you things like uh, discover something really big, and, uh, which is not really very useful. Uh, but uh, uh, then you, if you discover it, thousands of people work on it, and thousands of people worked on this problem, and then you get the Nobel Prize. Really good deal. Um, so this is us getting the Nobel Prize in 1996. In Stockholm, you're all dressed up in white tie and tails. This was 100 years since Nobel's death, actually. Uh, the first three guys, they only ever divided three ways in the particular categories. First three guys are the physicists. Uh, these are super cool Mercury guys. 
a um, good group of guys. Uh, Nobel mandated that the physicists should always be first because he thought physicists were the smartest people on earth and most people in this room know they are. <laughs> <laughs> but physicists are working more and more on biology, and uh, that was actually the, the text of some of the more, more public remarks that some of these guys made. Uh, then the Bucky Wall chemists from, uh, from um, uh, uh, England and, uh, and, and Houston. Uh, then us, uh, the Knight Literature Laureate, uh, a poet uh, from Poland, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Zimborska, Zimborska. And, uh, and who died recently, and then Jim Merleys, the economics prize winner. Uh, the, actually, he shared it with another guy, but the guy uh, was 80 years old, he partied and he died before he got there, which is... <laughs> uh, so if you get off at the Nobel Prize in advanced years, just be careful. <laughs> The Nobel Prize for Economics is actually not one of Nobel's prizes. It's the Swedish Prize for e Swedish Bank's Prize for Economics in the name of Alfred Nobel. They bought their way into the Nobel Prize in the 1960s, and that was good because it's worth a lot more money. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, he's a really nice guy. Actually, he's, a, he's one of the good economists, not one of the awful ones. Uh, and uh, you never get any more prizes after the Nobel Prize. You get your picture painted. Uh, this one. You know, as I said, Danny Thomas was Lebanese, and the board of our hospital is American, Lebanese, Syrian Catholics. And they're very powerful, very involved. They're involved in the third generation now. They're responsible for a lot of the fundraising. But I think it's the only time I've ever looked even vaguely Lebanese. <laughs> <laughs> and I got on a stamp, but everyone gets on a stamp. You know, when, the, when our Olympic athletes go off to, to Olympia, whatever, they all get photographed before they go, and if they win, they're on a stamp the next day. Um, and then this is the Australian portrait that's in the Australian National Gallery. It's a cheerful portrait. <laughs> A wonderful Australian painter, Rick Amor. Uh, Rick, uh, normally his subjects are, everything is very dark, and he normally paints decrepit industrial landscapes, and that's me. <laughs> but people couldn't get over how much light there was in it. Um, my wife says that's how I look at breakfast. And, and you get honorary degrees, and this, this tells you something, well, well, it tells you all men, if they're not fools, they can be made to look like them. Um, it tells you why there's never been an Irish Pope. Um, <laughs> To wear one of these hats successfully, you need one of those square faces. You know, you need, uh, and if you've got sticky out ears, you're lost. <laughs> it also tells you men have absolutely no idea what to do with flowers. <laughs> And this is the latest honour, uh, probably the last. Uh, uh, this is in my hometown of Brisbane. Uh, the building in the background is Bobby Road. <laughs> Uh, but actually, if you turn the camera the other way, there's a new bo Bogger Road, a biosciences precinct, which is very nice. And it, it's not the Queensland government that did that to me, it's my friend with the camera. So. <laughs> now, I'm not going to talk about science. But the, the one thing, of course, that's obvious to anyone who's interested in radiation is that all these events in the immune response require a lot of proliferation. And of course, cell cells are very radiation sensitive, and so it was during that time. And of course, we ablate the immune system when we treat for cancer and all the rest of it. And, uh, I'm not going to talk about um, any of the science because I've, I think I've, 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 I've detained you long enough. Um, some really good stuff there, actually. <laughs> oh, here's, a, here's another. Uh, here's some, this is serial killers. You watch those, you'll see some of those cells will go on and kill and kill and kill. These are time lapse photography uh, taken over hours. Uh, it's, it's not that rapid. But you can see the, the cells will migrate, they'll go from one target to another and kill and kill, in a tissue culture dish at least. And, um, what is their life cycle? How long do they live for? Pardon? The killer cells, how long do they live for? Um, we're not too sure. I think after we withdraw the, uh, a lot of them die off after the acute immune response. Once the, uh, the infection's gone and they're no longer being stimulated, they've been very, very stimulated. They're kind of terminally differentiated, a number of them, I think. Most of them die off, but a proportion of the cells persist into memory. And there's a big debate still going on in immunity about whether the cells that persist into memory are cells that never went that far or they come from that population. Very difficult if you're doing the population dynamics of these things because, uh, um, you, the cells go all around the body 
Uh, we never really quite know how many there actually are. We don't know that much about their transit times. We're getting more information with these uh, two photo microscopes and that sort of stuff, but it's a, it's a difficult problem. So you Long yeah, they, these are cells that are turning over. We think, and they're turning over. Uh, they're turning over physiologically, uh, we think. But we don't really understand homeostatic control in the immune system. I mean, if you think about it, a liver's a liver, or a brain's a brain. A brain grows to a certain size, and if it tries to grow any bigger and it's inside a skull, you're in real trouble. But the immune system can expand and contract quite a bit, and we don't understand what tends to keep it at about the same numbers. And it's an interesting problem, partly a mathematical uh, a problem for mathematicians and theoretician uh, models. Although I, I never have much success in interesting the models in it. But um, anyway, it may be too hard or something. But um, it's, uh, it, there are big questions. Uh, and uh, the other thing I've been doing a lot is since I came back to Australia, and, and before that really I spent a lot of time uh, trying to talk generally about science. Uh, the, the Beginner's Guidebook, which does have a chapter telling you how to win the Nobel Prize, was really a, an attempt to try and talk about science to the broader community. And uh, um, people still buy the book with it because they're come by the title. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just been translated into its second form of Chinese. It's been just, uh, translated into all sorts of languages. But of course, once it's translated into Chinese, you, you've no, no idea what it says. It might, it might say, you know, obey the party bosses or something. I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, I read up on climate change because I tried to understand what was happening there. And it's kind of, you know, it's a problem in the physical sciences in the main, though we bi biologists do read out certain things and wrote that. And then, uh, then I've written this book about, um, about birds and infection and toxins and birds monitoring the world. Again, partly an extension of, of you know, what, what are we doing environmentally and so forth. Uh, the Americans didn't like the title, they didn't like the cover, and they, they put a pigeon on instead. And, uh, and I had to do a lot of rewriting for Americanizing it. And, and then I've just written a book on pandemics what everyone needs to know, which is part of a, it's not out here yet, but it's part of a series like Modern China, what everyone needs to know, the Catholic Church, what everyone needs to know, uh, whether it's question and answer, it's a really weird book. <laughs> a weird book to write. I, I hope it's informative. Anyway, that's, uh, that's enough from me. Thank you.